it is given to them, uh, what happens to them. Or in other words, what happens to them is based upon how they hear and what they do with it. Now in this world, there's a lot of people in this world that does not want to hear the word of God. Now, of course, the Supreme Court rejected, uh, if you have not watched the news, the Supreme Court rejected to hear the case of the defense of marriage and um, decided not to hear an argument to defend traditional marriage and to ban uh, homosexual civil unions and marriage and things like that. They decided not to hear the argument against that. And so therefore this was a uh, big win for the gay rights movement. And whereas there were at least 19 states that um, uh, had uh, legalized same-sex marriages, uh, now Indiana, Oklahoma, uh, Virginia, and other states are going to join in and they estimate very shortly there will be at least 30 states out of the 51 states in the United States that uh, will approve uh, gay marriage or uh, civil unions. And of course, they're trying to get it on the ballot here in Michigan um, to allow uh, civil unions and all these type of things. God is angry. And the Bible says he's angry with the wicked every day and that the whole world lieth in wickedness. Now, of course, uh, most um, people do not support uh, homosexual uh, marriage or civil unions. Um, there was a poll on the internet uh, that polled uh, how many, what was the percentage of people that were in favor of the Supreme Court not to hear the argument uh, versus those that um, uh, would say that, uh, or should I say there was a poll set up to whether one agreed with the Supreme Court as to whether they should or should not hear uh, the argument uh, in defense of marriage. And of course, I took part of that poll and voted that I disagree with the Supreme Court in them upholding um, laws that substantiate uh, civil unions and uh, gay marriage. And of course, 69% of the vote voted that they disagree with the Supreme Court's decision to uphold these things. And so it has been a fact that most Americans are not in support of that. And of course, in 2004, when Michigan voted, uh, a great majority of Michiganders voted against uh, gay marriage and voted to uphold uh, the Marriage Act, traditional marriage. But you have some that are in political positions and in judicial positions and are in legislative positions that are bowing down and being bought off by um, the gay rights movement, and those that uh, promote that type of lifestyle um, because of money. And so people wonder why the United States is dealing with this illness of Ebola, dealing with other viruses. People wonder why we are dealing with ISIS and ISIS is continuing to get stronger and stronger, even though that the United States with the coalition are going over there bombing almost every day. God is angry. Now, God not only judges individuals, but God judges countries also. And if you didn't uh, know that, um, then just look at Israel in the scriptures. He judged Israel and told them that because of their wicked ways, he's going to let another country from the north come in and take them captive. And he did under Nebuchadnezzar, came down and took Judah captive and enslaved them for 70 years. He was also angry with the Israelites and, and of course these uh, nations, Israel, Judah, uh, boasted of being God's people, of which they were. And of course, God allowed the Assyrians to come in and to take Israel captive, the 10 tribes, into slavery and into oppression. And of course, God allowed these nations to come and to judge Israel. And he turned around and judged those nations that judged Israel because they were too hard on Israel. And that's why Israel is in the position today because she's under judgment. So there's judgment upon this country. 
There's judgment upon the United States. And people wonder why 9-11 happened and why some of these other things is happening in this country. It's because God is angry. Now, I'm not saying that God flew the planes into the Twin Towers. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that there are a lot of things that are happening in this country that God has allowed to happen in this country because of the sins of this country. And, and this country is under judgment. And it's only going to get worse as time goes on as we get to the coming of Jesus Christ. God hates homosexuality. And he burnt up an entire, well, he burnt up Sodom and Gomorrah and two cities because of it. And the scripture says that God told uh, Abraham that the people in Sodom and Gomorrah were wicked sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And so he's very angry and uh, the, this country is going to pay uh, for their defection uh, of God from straying away from God, even though they claim to be a Christian country. The United States is very far from a Christian country, very far from it. But anyway, um, all of these things are efforts to attack God's church. And God's going to fight for his church. Can we say amen? He's not going to allow the, the demons of this world to overcome his church. He already said the gates of hell should not prevail against it. And of course, we have this president, um, Barack Obama, who has done less for the African-American community than any other president that we've ever had. And of course, he is uh, anti-Christ himself uh, in being the doorway of introducing a lot of these things into this country. And so there's great wrath that's coming upon this country. There's great wrath coming upon this world. Uh, and of course, that's not our subject, but, but uh, the scripture specifically talks about that. God does judge countries for their sins. And the United States is not exempt at all. But in our dealing with the parable, Jesus is revealing truths to us that will help us to be what God's called us to be. So the sower, as we look at the 13th chapter of the gospel according to St. Matthew, and uh, we're going to pick it up uh, in verse number three, and we'll read verse three all the way down to verse number nine. And then we'll go back and pick up where we left off uh, on tonight. So if we all have it, let's pick it up. Matthew chapter 13, verse number three through nine. All right, we have it. Let's read. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear? let him hear. And of course, that's the point of the parable. It has to do with hearing the word of God. There are a lot of people that come to church and don't really hear the word of God. You can have two people sitting shoulder to shoulder in the church and the word of God can go forth. One can hear it and it has an impact and change their lives. Another can just sit there and has no effect upon them whatsoever. As a matter of fact, they can be bored uh, with the whole process. Um, but he shows us the effect that it has based upon the type of heart that an individual has. And so the wayside is there, those that hear the word. Of course, he gives us the interpretation uh, of the parable further down. And so let's pick it up, verse number uh, 18, and we'll read verses 18 through 23. All right, we have it, let's read. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by what? The wayside. Well, 
They hear, but they don't understand. But before they can get an understanding, the devil comes and snatches it out. And they are right back into the same condition that they were before they came to church. They're right back out there in the world. He snatches that word out of their heart, as we read uh, in another scripture, lest they should believe. And it makes an impact upon them. The devil does not want us to believe what God says. And he does everything he can through circumstances and through whatever means he can to get us not to believe what God said. Because he knows that if we believe what God said, all things are possible to him that what? Believe it. And so everything that the devil does, he attacks our faith to get us, to try to get us to lose our confidence in what God has said. To try to get us to not to trust God. To not to depend on God. This is what he tries to do. The devil always comes to attack our faith. What we believe about God. Is God going to do it for me? He doesn't too much mind us hearing about what God has done for somebody else. But will God do it for me? Is he hearing my prayers? Is he going to work for me? And a lot of times we base our conditions and circumstances on whether or not God has heard us. But you can't even do that. You have to do it by faith. We walk by faith and not by what? Not by sight. So um, this is what he does. Though they are the ones that receive seed by the wayside. They hear the word, but before it can do anything within them, the devil comes and snatches it out. They allow the devil to trick them to snatch that word out of their heart lest they should believe. Now we've dealt with that already. Let's read um, and we've dealt with the stony places. Uh, verse number 20 the stony heart but he that received the seed into stony places the same is he that heareth the word and immediately with joy receives it. Yet hath he not rooted himself but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word by and by, he is offended or he goes right back into sin. So this is an individual that comes in, hears the word, gets saved, and everything is fine until trouble comes. Everything is fine till difficulty comes, till temptation comes. And they are right back out there where they were. Of course, we had a young lady here that was doing fine for a while. But as soon as her ex-boyfriend got out of jail, she's right back out there, right back out in the streets, right back out there. He's got her prostituting and, and all these other types of things. These are those that are here and they enjoy the service. They enjoy the singing. They enjoy the preaching. They come in and get saved, part of the church, but as soon as trouble comes, temptation comes, they don't last. And this is what we're dealing with today when our churches are like revolving doors. As fast as they come in, they leave right back out. They just don't last. The scripture says they dureth for a while and they're right back out there, back out there um, doing the things that they used to do, going right back into bondage. Well, we've already dealt with that, so we're going to move to uh, sow seed among the thorns. And that's in verse number 22. Let's, if we have that, let's read verse 22. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh what? Unfruitful. So they allow the things of the world. This is an individual that uh, becomes corrupted. They hear the word. They have the word. But they become corrupted. He says, but he that receives seed uh, he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care, what? Of this world. The care of this world. And the deceitfulness of what? Riches. Choke the word. 
and it becomes unfruitful. These things come and attack the word that is in the individual. And because the individual is more concerned about the cares of this world, more concerned uh, uh, and has been deceived by the deceitfulness of riches, they, 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 they deem the things of the world more important than their soul. And so what happens to the word? It's choked out. There is no life of the word of God in their lives because they have now compromised. And this is a real big thing today because you see it in a lot of preachers today. And you can tell by what they preach in their pulpits. They want to talk about prosperity. They want to talk about health and wealth. Now, when I was getting dressed for church tonight, I saw that, um, uh, what's his name? Steve Harvey had Paula White on his program. And of course, he says now, you have been divorced twice just like I have. And she says, yes, I'm just waiting on Mr. Wright. Now she's a pastor, supposed to be a preacher. Failed twice <laughs> and supposed to be a preacher. You know, and he's basically saying, you're just like me, whatever, and, and all this other kind of stuff. But she's a prosperity preacher. She preaches God wants you rich, that you're not supposed to be sick. And if you get sick, something's wrong with your faith. If you're poor, you're not what God wants you to be. They are preaching the message of prosperity. And I want you to understand that there is no prosperity outside of Jesus Christ. Prosperity is not in how much money you got, how many fine clothes you have, how many cars you drive, how big your house is, how much money you have in a bank. That's not prosperity. Prosperity is only in Jesus Christ. Because if you don't have him, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and what? Lose his own soul. But see, these are supposed to be preachers that are telling us that this is what God wants. They don't talk about prospering in prayer. They don't talk about prospering in living holy. They don't talk about prospering living free from sin. They don't talk about prospering in your relationship with God. They want to talk about prospering in your money, in your things. And that's man's biggest problem today, things. That's his biggest problem. There is no prosperity other than in Jesus. Anything else is not prosperity. It's the deceitfulness of what? Riches. Can we say amen? Deceitful. And I heard one preacher get on television and say Jesus was a rich man and lived in a big house. I said, where did he get that from? <laughs> because he said the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man had not a place to lay his head. Now, I don't know how plain, much more plain you can get than that. Can you say amen? You know, he didn't live in no big house. He didn't have a whole lot of money. As a matter of fact, he told Peter to go out, go out and fish it and catch this fish and take the money out of the fish and go pay their taxes. That's how he paid his taxes. So, um, this is what's happening. And of course, our Lord spoke of it way back then. And we are seeing the effects of it today. That the cares of this life, People are so caught up in their life, in the things that they're doing, that it just chokes out the word of God. And like I showed, somebody sent me that article, and I need to find that article, and I was sharing it with them, with the saints in Grand Rapids. That if we handled our Bible as often as we handled our phones, we'd be a lot better Christian. If we reach for the word of God as much as we reach for the phone, the cell phone, checking the emails, checking the tweets, blogging. What about God's tweets? Where's God's tweets at? It's in the Bible. What about his email? Can we say amen? What about God's emails? What about God's blogs? If we were so concerned about the word of God as we're about our cell phones, some of us use our cell phones in the bathroom. You know, 
and all these type of things while the Bible is sitting on the shelf collecting dust if, if, if one even has one. You can rest assured folk got cell phones but you're not too sure whether or not they have a Bible and of course I, I, I received an email that the Bible has now been translated in a thousand different languages. I think it's the only book that has been translated into a, a thousand different versions of languages of the Bible. It's still the best-selling book in human history. What God is saying, what God has said, the word of God, which upholds everything. The Bible says he upholds all things by the word of his power. And people are more concerned about the cares of this life, the concerns about this life, to such an extent to where they don't go to church, but they'll go to work. They can't come to church tonight because they got a cold, but they'll go to work with the flu. They can't go to church because it's cold, but they'll go to work in 10 below zero 20 feet of snow. They won't even wait for the plow truck. They'll, 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 they'll make their car to plow. You hear what we're saying? People do that. Well, I don't want to drive all the way to Bay City, the church for Saginaw, but they'll drive to Detroit every day to go to work. Or they'll drive to Flint. Or they'll drive up north every day to go to work. Cares of this life choking out the word and the deceitfulness of deceitfulness of riches choke the word and they become what unfruitful they are unfruitful in the sight of God and what did Jesus do to a particular tree he cursed a tree he walked by a fruit tree and he cursed it and the disciple, the disciple says why did he curse it because he said they ain't bringing forth no fruit and that's what happens in St. John chapter 15, Jesus said, every branch in me that bringeth forth not fruit is withered away. And men gather them and cast them into the fire to be burned. That's what happens to an unfruitful person that hears the word and allows the cares of this life, which is more important to him than the word, more important than his soul, and the deceitfulness of riches choke that word out to where God can't use them and they're like an apple tree with no apples on it or a pear tree. He came to a tree and looked for some fruit on it and he cursed it because it didn't have no fruit on it. And that's what's happening with a lot of people today. This is the mystery that God wants to reveal to us not to allow the things of this world to cause the word of God to be ineffective in us because of our compromising. Can we say amen? You follow? All right, choke the word and it becometh, and he becometh unfruitful. All right, well, let's go to Mark, Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 4, and verse 18 and 19. Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 4. Verse 18 through 19. All right. And Mark chapter 4, verse 18 through 19. We're going to get a little more information concerning the same subject. Let's read verse 18 and 19. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of what? Other things. I got an article written by Bishop Morris E. Golder, the late Bishop Morris E. Golder. And the article is about the lusts of other things. The desires of other things. Man's problem today is desires. And man uses the desires of himself that causes him to fall away from God. 
And when we talk about man, we talk about mankind, not just the male gender, mankind. And the lust of other things, the desires of the things of the world, they do what? Entering in, entering where? Into the heart of the hearer, choke the word, and it becometh what? Unfruitful. The word don't work for them because it's unfruitful. Because they're unfruitful. Cares of this world, seemingness of riches, and the lusts of other things. The desires for other things causes them to compromise their relationship with God. They lose their convictions and go after the lusts of other things. Well, Jesus is saying that this is a type that is in the church and we cannot not, not allow this to happen to us. Can we say amen? All right. Well, um, let's go back to Matthew chapter 13 and read the here that is considered the good ground here. The heart which is good ground. Matthew 13, and we're going to pick it up, verse number 23. And he says, but he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth fruit some a hundredfold, some 60 and some what? 30 fold. One, these are the ones that will be saved. Those that hear the word, they are not allowing the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, trials and tests, not allowing the devil to come in and snatch that word out of their heart. They're keeping that word in their heart. They're bringing forth fruit and they bring forth varying degrees of amount of fruit. These are the ones that will be saved. Let's go to Luke chapter 11 verse 27 to 28. The good ground. Luke chapter 11 Verse 27 to 28. All right. Let's read. And it came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. But he said, Yea, rather, Blessed are they that hear the word of God and what? You want to be blessed? Then hear the word and what? Keep it. He didn't say nothing about money. He say amen. <laughs> now God can't bless with money, but that money's going to, you know, he might bless you with some money, but you're going to spend that money. That money's going to be gone after a while. He can bless you with some clothes, but those clothes are going to wear out after a while. Or you might outgrow them, unfortunately. Bless you with a car, but that car gonna need some oil one day. It's gonna car gonna break down. But blessed is he that hears the word of God and keeps it. So we should realize then that if we are hearing the word and we're keeping it, we are what? We're blessed. You know, you're not cursed. You're what? You're blessed. And we need to thank God. Say, Lord, thank you for giving me an ear to hear the word. Thank you for blessing me to be able to hear the word. Because there's a lot of people that are not getting no word. A whole lot of them not getting no word. They're getting some other stuff. They're not getting things from God. They're getting some other things. From the devil and from the deceits of people's own minds is what they're getting. All right, well, let's go to 1st Epistle of John, chapter 3, and verse 9 and 10. It's a blessing to have a mind to hear the word of God and value it so that we keep it and observe it. That's a blessing. First Epistle of John, chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. 
Now, why is that such a blessing? Well, we're going to read about it right here. 1 John 3, verse 9 through 10. Blessing to hear the word. All right. Let's read. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Now hold it right there. He that is what? Born. How is one born of God? Born of the water and spirit. Baptized in Jesus' name and what? Filled with the Holy Ghost. Baptized in Jesus' name filled with the Holy Ghost. He in this, well, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Doth means he does not continue to practice sin. And of course we believe and we teach and we practice living holy, living a sin-free life. And people automatically want to tell you, oh well nobody's perfect. We ain't saying about being perfect. We're talking about living holy. We're talking about hearing the word and what? Keeping it. That's what we're talking about. Now, if you're going to tell me that you not being perfect means that you're not hearing the word and keeping it, then you're going to be lost. That's all that means. There's no excuse. God has not made any provision for anybody to be saved in their sins. When there is an availability of them to hear the word and to keep it. Where God provides an individual to hear the word and to keep it. There is no provision made for them to be saved outside of them hearing the word and keeping it. But see, people, they say, well, you're judging me. Now, when people say you're judging me by you telling them that they're wrong, what's judging them really is their conscience. That's what it is. Because as Jesus addressed those individuals that brought the woman caught in adultery. Remember that scripture? The, they said, Lord, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Moses said she should be stoned. What do you say? And Jesus had stooping down on the ground, writing on the ground. And they kept asking. He got him and said, he that without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And the Bible says everyone was convicted by their conscience. So when you tell people they're wrong and tell them why they're wrong based upon what the word of God says and they want to lash back out at you, that's because they're condemned. Their conscience is condemning them. And the Bible says if your conscience condemns you, God is greater. So if your heart is telling you you're wrong, then if God comes by and tells you wrong, that is a, can be a greater condemnation. So whoever is born of God, saved, they do not practice sin. Do not commit sin. How is that? Well, he says, for his what? Seed remaineth in him. That seed is the word. Because that word is constantly there, constantly there. They're blessed because they hear it and they are doing it. And as long as the word is there, remaining there, that saint will never sin. Because he that is born of God doth not commit sin because his seed is in him. And the seed that is in him is what's keeping him or her from sinning. You follow? So this notion that nobody, everybody sins, nobody can live free from sin is a lie from the pit of hell. Because he just got done telling us, John said, he that is born of God doth not commit sin because his seed, the word, is in him. Now, if the word can hold the sun in place, can't the word hold you from getting high? Smoking crack? We say, amen. Cussing somebody out, slapping somebody upside the head, stealing? Of course it can, if we want to be kept. That word is powerful enough to hold the sun in place 96 million miles away. And even though it's 96 million miles away, that sun, God's word, can allow that sun to bring such heat that it'll burn you up right down here. If you don't believe me, go to Dominican Republic. It'll burn you up while you stand out there. I don't care how dark you are, you'll be darker once you leave there. And the sun is 96 million miles away. 
What's doing that? The word of God. Well, if the word can do that, then the word can keep me. It can keep you. But we cannot allow the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things, the devil coming in trying to snatch it out, trials causing us to give up. We have to endure all those things. He that is born of God, whosoever is born of God, doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is what? Born of God. Now some preachers try to justify this and say, or try to justify their teaching of this by saying that yes, it's true, we're not sinning, Basically, even though we are sinning because God looks at us through the blood of Jesus Christ and he doesn't see our sins. So therefore, salvation is not based upon your behavior. It's based upon what Christ did on Calvary. That's a lie from hell. Because in that the case, the wages of sin cannot be what? Death. That's a lie. That's all it is. They just lying because they want some of that what? They want their money. Because if they get up and preach against sin, if Joel Osteen got up and preached against sin like he, like God would want him to, he wouldn't have that big crowd. And he would not be smiling every Sunday like he's smiling. He wouldn't be talking about his trials of going to McDonald's and they got his hamburger order wrong. He'll be talking about how the devil tried to take him out. Can we say amen? The devil's like, oh, Joel is my buddy. You ain't gonna mess with him. You know, I ain't gonna mess with the, I'm, I'm going to base, I'm getting Pastor Johnson. That's who I'm gonna get. Because he's online talking about me. Can we say amen? Talking about going to heaven. So I'm gonna let some stuff happen in his life. I need to slow him down. He can't slow me down. You know, can't you slow me down. I may lay awake at night, but that's all right. Jesus is going to what? Fix it. And while he's fixing it, I'm going to get on here and hammer the word out there. You say amen. No, no. The only way you're going to stop me, you got to put me in the grave. And then in the grave, I'm just sleeping, waiting on the trump to sound. That's the only way going to shut me up. You got to put me in the grave. And it ain't going to happen until God said it can happen. Amen. Well, uh, because he is born of who? God. The problem is, there's not a lot of people today that's born of God. Now I heard Bishop Combs get out, gave out a figure and say that there has been 500 million people that have been filled with the Holy Ghost since the day of Pentecost. I don't know where he got that number from. I don't even know how anybody could even have that number. But he says that there's 500 million people that have been filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm inclined to believe that there's a lot more than that that have been filled. But 500 million is quite a number. But I'm inclined to think that uh, there's a lot more than that because, uh, of course, there's 1.2 million uh, members in the PAW that have the Holy Ghost. So, of course, it's got to be more than 500, 500 million. Well, I said 1.2 million. Is that right? Yeah, 1.2 million is not the same as 500 million, but I'm inclined to think that if there's 1.2 million in the PAW that have the Holy Ghost, I'm quite sure over a 2,000 year period, but I don't know where he got that figure, but nonetheless, that's the figure he came up with, 500 million. But be that as it may, the problem is today that a lot of people are not really born of God, but they are told that they have been born of God and they really have it well verse number 10 let's read in this the children of God are what manifest in other words this is how you can tell the difference between the children of God and the other children can we say amen the other children are who the children of Ethel no they're the children of the devil that's who they are in this the children of God are manifest or revealed and the children of who? There's two types of children. The children of what? Children of God and the children of what? Devil. It's two types of children now. Two types. That's all he says. He didn't say in this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil and the children of so-and-so and the children of so-and-so and all the other kind of stuff. No. 
Children of God and the children of the devil. Children of God have been born of God. The children of the devil have not been born of God. Can we say amen? Being born of God is being baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. Speaking in other tongues, the Spirit of God gives utterance. Pastor Johnson, you trying to say that I'm a child of the devil? I ain't saying nothing. The Bible is saying it. Can we say amen? I was just telling you what the Bible said. Don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you what's in the book. You all out there in uh, internet land or whatever, Facebook, what have you, this is what the Bible says. Now, if you don't believe the Bible, Paul said, what if some did not believe, would not believe? Let God be true and every man a what? A liar. So if you don't believe it, that's on you. I don't care. I'm not going to lose, lose no sleep tonight just because you don't believe what we teach it. You know. I'm going to sit back and drink my Lipton Diet green tea and shout hallelujah. That's your soul. Can we say amen? <laughs> well, in this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth, knows that TH, continues to do not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth what? Not his brother. Now, homosexuals are children of the devil. That's what they are. We might as well say it right now. Every homosexual and lesbian is children of the devil. And ain't no such thing as bisexual. That's just a term that they're trying to use. No, if you go the other way, you gay. Can we say amen? You know, well, you know, I'm bisexual. No, you're perverted. That's what you are. And there's no such thing as gay marriage. No such thing as civil unions. See, man likes to come up with terms to try to defy behavior that is abominable in the sight of God. It's just an abomination. That's all it is. And so the children of the devil are those that do not righteousness. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. So if they're not of God, who are they of? They're of the devil. That's what the Bible says. Neither he that what? Loveth not what? His brother. And loving your brother means to treat your brother according to the word of God. According to God's commandments. Because Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's how God values or that's how he sees love. Love is in keeping God's commandments. And if we keep his commandments, we love him. If we treat each other according to his commandments, we love our brother and what? Sister. All right. Well, that's all there. So let's go to back to Matthew 13 and pick up the next parable, which is the tares among the wheat. All right. We got about half hour and we'll try to get through this here. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 13. And let's look at the tares among the wheat. Verse 24 down to verse 30. All right. If we have it, let's read. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst now thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Well, what is he talking about there? The tares among the wheat. 
Let's jump over to um, verse number, let me see here. Um, we're going to jump over to verse number 37. Yes, thank you, verse 37. All right, let's read there. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. In the church, or shall we put it like this, the rapture will determine who's saved or who's not when it comes to in God's church. Now, the tares looks just like the wheat. And the reason why he did not want the servant to go in there and try to get all the tares because he might destroy some of the wheat. He says, I will take care of it in the time of judgment. I will show who is my children and who is of the devil. Now, of course, the church of God started out on a high note with the apostles. And of course, when the apostles died, as he says here in verse 25, but while men slept, when the apostles died, the enemy, the devil, came in and showed and sowed tares among the wheat. The devil, when the apostles died, really came in and did a lot of damage because the apostles had passed off the scene and had caused so much damage to the point to where the apostolic doctrine was almost completely gone. And the Catholic Church was founded in 150 AD, held its first mass in 150 AD, and the Catholic Church started out as an apostolic church. But down through the years, they began to compromise and began to become paganistic. And of course, it eventually evolved into what we know of it as today. But it did not start out that way. And a lot of the things that go on in secular churches today has to do with because of the influence of the Catholic Church of which the 17th chapter of Revelation calls the great whore that sets upon many waters, the false church system. Now, we're not trying to speak disrespect of the Catholic Church because I know Bay City is a uh, predominantly Catholic Polish com community, uh, but that's just the way it is. If you say amen, it ain't my fault. It ain't my fault if the, if, 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 if the, if the angel says the great whore sets upon many waters. I, this was written before I came along. Because if you trace the history of the Catholic Church, out of some 60 million Christians that have been martyred, 50 million were martyred by Papal Rome or the Catholic Church because of the Christians that would not deny Christianity and follow Catholicism. That's exactly what they did. And of course, um, when Islam was founded, Islam began because of the influences of the Catholic Church. And of course, the um, Muhammad who went out there and decided that he was going to lead a revolt and decided he was going to get some people to follow him, went into city after city and conquered it and demanded that the people deny Catholicism and accept Islam and recite the prayer. And those that would not recite the prayer 
and accept Islam and Muhammad as his prophet, the Muslim prayer, they executed him. So Islam was no better than Catholicism. Because they were killing people that wouldn't follow them. And of course, Martin Luther, who was the first reformer during the Protestant Reformation, broke off from the Catholic Church. He never intended to leave the Catholic Church, but he saw the abuses in the Catholic Church and the abuses of the Pope, and the Pope having so much power, and the Pope saying that it was against the law for anybody to have a Bible, and that the Pope was the only one that had the authority to make changes in the scriptures. They forced Martin Luther out, and he went out and began his own thing. But don't think of Martin Luther as a great uh, man of God because it's recorded in history that he martyred 400 people that wouldn't follow him. So he was just as bad. Can you say amen? Now all this is part of history. You can research this stuff out and find out for yourself. It's all part of history. Yeah. But be that as it may, while men slept, while the apostles were gone, the devil came in and sowed tares among the wheat brought in people that appeared to be the children of God, but they were not. They were of the enemy. And that's what we're dealing with today. We're dealing with today where a lot of people are claiming to be God's children, when in fact they're actually children of the devil. And they're children of the devil because of how they live. Jesus said, by their fruits, you will know them. He said, how can you tell a false prophet? You can tell him by his fruits, how he lives, how he practices. Like the preacher that OD'd on cocaine and died. That was the leader of a great big old church. And they tried to put him in heaven in his funeral. I mean, the man died as, died as a drug addict. There are not going to be any drug addicts in heaven. Can we say amen? No, they're not going to be. So even though that he might have been a nice guy and had a big church and was well loved, he's not one of God's children because God's children don't do drugs and, and OD on cocaine. They just don't. Can we say amen? You know, precious in the sight of the Lord is not the death of a cocaine addict, but the death of his saints. And his saints are those that don't commit what? Sin because they're, his seed is in them. All right, and that's the word. So the rapture will determine. Well, let's go to the book of Jude, verse 3 and 4, and then we're going to jump down to verse 19. Jude, verse 3 and 4. Uh, we got about 20 minutes. Jude, verse 3 and 4. Tares among the wheat. We have some tares among us today. We have some among us that claim to be God's children, and they are not. And they're not, and we, can, and we know that they're not, because herein is manifest, he that is not born of God does not righteousness. Well, Jude, verse 3 and 4. This is what we're dealing with today in our time. Beloved... When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Now, hold it. There's different uses of the word common in the Bible. One expression is a common woman. And that word common has to do with a woman that will give herself to any man. A prostitute. A common woman. But in this verse here, common means the same. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation or the same salvation, the salvation that is common or the same to everyone that has it. There's only one salvation. There's only one way to be saved, Oprah. Can we say amen? Not many paths to God. There's only one, one way, one way, one way to God. Jesus said, I am the way. Can we say Amen. And somebody told her that, and she said, how can, how can Jesus be the only way? There's got to be another way. Well, what other way is it then? She couldn't answer that. Now she was looking good on the program. Her hair was, look, 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 was, was shining, but she didn't know God. That just, and she got an argument with her. You can see it online if you look it up online. She got an argument with her audience. And the argument was, 
How can there be more than one way to God? Isn't that something? Blind. But anyway, um, common salvation. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Let's read. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you or encourage you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once what? Fight for the truth. Fight for the faith. Why? Verse 4. For there are certain men what? Crept in what? Otherwise there are tares among the wheat. And who's brought those tares in? The enemy did it. We got tares in the PAW. Tares on the bishop board. Among the wheat. In the church. Tares among the wheat. And he says need for me to write unto you. For there are certain men that crept in unawares. Now it wasn't that we were unaware who they were. But we were unaware of what was in them. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. What type of man? Ungodly men. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. And denying the only Lord God and our what? Lord Jesus Christ. Now how do they deny him? By not living for him. Talking about him but not living for him. Preaching but not living for him. Denying him. Denying the only Lord God even our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we are dealing with today. Crept in unawares. And you go to the council. When you go to the council, there's tares among the wheat. Go to certain fellows, go to the convention, there's tares among the wheat. You see the people of God out there, but there's the children of the wicked one out there too. And they're not all in the audience. Some of them are in the pulpit. Some of them got robes on. Some of them are pastors. Tares among the wheat. There was one incident where um, a pastor was being sued by his church because, first of all, he was abusing the saints, stealing money, and he was shacked up with a woman in a trailer next to the church. And so, <laughs> and so the, uh, they went to court and one of our bishops who was the diocesan over that church disfellowshipped the man because him sleeping around in the church and shacking up with a woman next door to the church and wasn't even married. So one of the other bishops went down there to support this man and brought charges against the diocesan bishop and the bishop boy was going to strip that bishop because he went down to the courthouse. Not strip the pastor that was sleeping around. Not reprimand the bishop in support of the pastor sleeping around. You follow what we're saying? There are some tares among what? The wheat. Tares among the wheat. There was one bishop who had charges brought against him. A woman came, brought Charlie, and, 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 and some of the other bishops said, well, let's just wait for the election to pass because he's up for election and then we will deal with the charges. Election came, he was elected to the high position, never dealt with the charges. Tares among the weak. They don't want to deal with sin. But if you fail in your financial obligations, they're ready to deal with you on that when it comes to money. Never mind about how the person's living. Never mind if the person is a homosexual or not. Like one bishop said, how do you know? <laughs> and all these type of things. Well, that's what we're dealing with today. What's going on? Certain men have what? Crept in on the world. And they have, some of them have assumed leadership positions. Just like in our world reason why homosexuality is being proliferated and laws being changed in favor of them is because some of them have got into leadership positions in our states, in our governments, legislatures, judges, and all these type of things. Can we say amen? That's what's going on today. Well, that's why God's going to burn this earth up 
and burn up anybody that is involved with them. Well, um, so we need to fight for the truth. And how do we fight against it? By preaching and teaching against it. I'm fighting right now. You have to teach against it. You have to preach against it. One brother had a church and the bishop came in there and taught false doctrine in his church. And he got up the next day in his church and said that that brother was wrong in what he was teaching. That is not what the Bible says. And corrected it and gave the sense of the scripture, what the truth was, and the saints shouted. Somebody recorded the pastor. Sent the tape to that bishop. And the bishop called got mad at him. Well, he had to do something because you teaching false doctrine. I'm not going to let nobody come in and teach no false doctrine in my church. I don't care who they are. You say, hey, man, you know, and got mad at him because of, of what he did. Well, you know, you don't go into somebody else's church to teach false doctrine. Well, anyway, we have to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints because there are tares among the wheat. And that's what, that's the mystery Jesus wanted us to get. That uh, the parable of the tares among the wheat is that there are my children out there and then there's the devil's children. Don't worry about them. I'll take care of them in the end. Because when the rapture takes place, they will be left here. All right. Well, let's see how Paul put it. Let's go to 1 Timothy well, let me see here. First, we want to read 1 John. Let's read 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 and 19. Let's read John's version of what Jude said about certain men that crept in unawares. All right. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 and 19. All right, if we have it, let's read. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Now, the Antichrist he's talking about is the devil that will be manifest in human flesh. Just as Jesus was God in human flesh, Satan is going to possess a man and take control and try to rule this world as God, the Antichrist. Now, as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is a what? Last time, there are many Antichrists now. What is an Antichrist? Anybody that denies that Jesus is God. Anybody that denies that Jesus is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Anybody that says that Jesus is not the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as is, a, is an Antichrist. Because Antichrist denies who Jesus is. All right? And so Antichrist does not believe that Jesus is the Father. And somebody said, well, that means every Trinitarian. Well, it certainly does. Because they don't say Jesus is the Father. They say Jesus is the second God among three. If that ain't Antichrist, I don't know what is. See, Antichrist means to be contrary to the teachings of Christ. That's what Antichrist is. And that's why we say that President Obama has the spirit of the Antichrist. The world has the spirit of the Antichrist because their theology and their belief system and their practices is contrary to the teachings of Christ. You follow? Antichrist. There are many antichrists whereby we know that it is what? Last time. We definitely know it's the last time now because now they're approving same-sex marriages. That's antichrist right there. All right? And you can't be antichrist and not suffer the consequences. Well, who are these antichrists? Let's read verse 19. They went out from who? Us. They went out from where? Us. Now, if they went out from us, let's read, but they were not of us, 
For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have what? Continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest or revealed that they were not all what? Of us. So there are some antichrists out there that have been baptized in Jesus' name filled with the Holy Ghost that were with us, that went out from us. In other words, we ordain them as ministers. We license them as ministers. We train them as ministers. And we sent them out. They went out from us, but they really were not what? Of us. Because if they had been of us, they would no doubt have what? Continue with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not what? All of us. They defected from the truth is what he's saying. They went out from us, but they were not of us, defected from the truth. These are the tares among the wheat, and we've got to keep ourselves separate from them and stay corrupted and fight for the truth and teach the truth. Can we say amen? And live for the truth. All right. Um, let's now go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we're winding down. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 16 through 21. We have about uh, seven minutes. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 16 through 21. I said 1 Timothy. There ain't no 16 to 21, is it? It must be 2 Timothy chapter 2. That's exactly what it is. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse. Let me see. I got verse 16 through 21. We will read that. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 16 through 21. All right. If we have it, let's read but shun or avoid profane and vain babblers, babblings, for they will increase unto more what? Now, if people try to avoid folks that just do a lot, bunch of talking, ain't talking about nothing. Rapping is a bunch of talk that ain't talking about really nothing. There used to be a guy in my day, I don't know if any of you all remember, some of y'all might be too young, others might remember. There was this one black guy, they called him Dolomite. You remember Dolomite? <laughs> so yeah, young people don't remember Dolomite. Dolomite would be dressed up in this crazy looking costume and just and music be in the background and he's just talking, just rambling on. Some of y'all can look him up, uh, pretty comical. And uh, of course he made a couple movies. Dolomite, uh, he did one movie, Disco Dolomite. It was in the disco era, and he had on the disco outfit, belly all big and everything. He had to try and do disco dance. And there was one uh, 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 Dolomite movie where he was trying to do karate, and the movie was so bad, you can see the guy standing there waiting for Dolomite to get his leg up to kick him and throw the fist at him. It was pretty comical, but it was one of those black exploitation movies that the NAACP, they're the one that coined that term. See, people like to try to say that the white folk back in the 70s uh, used to coin the term black exploitation. Oh no, there was other blacks that did that. Because a lot of them were jealous because some of the other blacks were making money in these movies. And it probably was some exploit, uh, exploitation done there. But uh, when I think about vain babblings, I think about Dolomite. Now if Elder Shivers was here, he'd be busting out laughing right now, me talking about Dolomite. <laughs> <laughs> Dolomite. But anyway, avoid just endless, senseless talk. Can you say amen? That ain't going to benefit nobody at all. Shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, because the point is, is that if a person talks too much, pretty soon they're going to say something that is what? Ungodly. They're going to say the wrong thing. All right, verse 17. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of the Son. They were out preaching 
false doctrine and cause some people to backslide, overthrow the faith of some. Verse 19, nevertheless, which means in spite of what they did, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are what? His. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Somebody said there's hypocrites in the church, not in God's church. There's liars in the church, not in God's church. There's uh, 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 um, uh, people in the church that ain't right, not in God's church. We talk about God's church, we talk about those that God knows that are what? His. There ain't no hypocrites there. there. Ain't no liars in that church. You see, there's three components of the church. The third component is those that God knows that are going to make the rapture. The Lord knoweth them that are his. So when people tell you, well, I don't go to church because there's too many hypocrites in the church, you tell them not in God's church, they're not. If you're looking at some hypocrites, they're not in God's church. They're just going to a building. But God's people are the ones that are not like that. Foundation of God standing sure, having the seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Let's read. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ do what? Depart from iniquity. So if we are his, let's depart from iniquity, sin, unacceptable worship of God. Now, verse number 20. Let's read. But in a a great house, and I think this might be our last scripture before we end tonight because we're about out of time. Out of time. Let's read. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to what? Dishonor. Now, the great house is the church. In the church, you have vessels of gold, silver, wood, and earth. Some of honor, some of dishonor. In the church, you have honorable saints. You have dishonorable saints. In the church, you have those that are of the quality of gold and silver. And you have some that are of the quality of wood and earth. Some to honor, some to dishonor. Verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, cleanse himself purifies himself by keeping, hearing God's word and obeying it, he shall be a vessel under what? Honor, sanctified, and meet or suitable for the master's use and prepared unto what? Every what? Good work. We want to be vessels unto what? Honor in the sight of God. We want to be honorable vessels sanctified, which means set aside, separated for the holy use of God and prepared unto what? Every good work. Now, I think we only covered two parables, did we? That's all we covered. So we're going to close the night. Um, we've covered two of them. And Lord have mercy, we got the mustard seed, the leaven, the hidden treasure, parable of great price, and the net. Are there any questions what we covered tonight? Yes.